Right. <clears throat> At the bottom of page 14, talking about the fact that Roncalli had to shoulder some of the blame for allowing this, um, uh, the violations of all of the promises made in the, uh, uh, leading up to the mixed marriage uh, between uh, King Boris of Bulgaria, who was uh, had well, was baptized Catholic, but then was baptized uh, sacrilegiously and validly as a schismatic later on, and so was raised a schismatic uh, because of political pressure on his father. Remember, we talked about all of that yesterday. Uh, but then he himself is married to a Catholic, and uh, after the fact, the uh, all of the promises. Uh, uh, made leading up to that because of which the dispensation for the mixed marriage was granted to begin with. That was, those were violated and the ceremony of marriage was repeated before a non-Catholic minister according to the quote-unquote orthodox rites and that uh, was uh, infuriated Pius XI, which of course we know he was, he was good at getting infuriated uh, and this was just another thing that uh, uh, you know, was, uh, quite rightly upset him. And Roncalli has, um, well, of course, allowed that to happen without objection, and that, uh, uh, therefore, he also merits uh, some, uh, say, uh, he, he merits uh, to be the, the object of displeasure as well. So Roncalli's biographer underlines the difference between the reactions of Pius XI and those of the future John XXIII, obviously to the advantage of the latter, the fuss over the Bulgarian marriage showed that Pius XI and Roncalli had completely contrasting temperaments. While the Pope waxed indignant and dramatized the situation, his apostolic visitor stayed cool, looked for a diplomatic solution, and played down the forceful papal statements. So he's, he's setting this up as a good thing. His biographer who likes him, likes Roncalli, is uh, saying, oh, see, Pius XI just got all upset that was Ron Colley kept a he, he kept a much more even keel than Pius XI. Yeah, and you know, there's a, there's not much plausibility to that, but what there is derives from the fact that uh, Pius XI indeed had a had a very fiery temperament. He demonstrated that sufficiently earlier on. Uh, so what he say what he's saying here is, is it's only a uh, one slight aspect of truth, but it does have that. But of course, as I uh, have on the next page. In reality, Pius XI, this is Father Ragosa's comment on this, uh, Pius XI acted as a man of faith who sees a sacrament trampled underfoot. The church injured in some sense, or her laws flaunted clearly, and the souls of the queen's children in danger. Roncalli, on the other hand, acted as a man of the world, irenic and ecumenical. So irenic is the opposite of polemic. One, the word polemics, or no, polemical, derived from the Greek word for war, whereas irenic or irenix is derived from the Greek word for peace. So that's, uh, that, that, that was a typical, that's a typical word that uh, modernists use. Oh, we're, we're all about irenix. We're all about uh, ma making peace. We're not about polemics, by which they could, they, they, uh, they, uh, a derogatory term that they'll use to, uh, to, to belittle anything they want to. Uh, anybody who uh, actually actively is engaged in defending the faith, for example, insisting on the on immutability of the of the doctrines of the church, or in this case, on the uh, inviolability of the sacraments. That they uh, that that that's to say that they are it is gravely sinful to violate them. They must not be violated. Uh, is all that's that's all just um, polemics and just fomenting hatred and war. That's all that is. So King Boris was satisfied, and on December or September 26, 1931, he decided to accept an official representative of the Holy See, which made Roncalli an apostolic delegate. And Pius XI renewed his tirade against the royal couple, and here we call, quote Roncalli's authoritative biography. Yet there are other uh, there are other works written about him and his his activities, but. This is the, the main one again. In March 1933, Boris and Giovanna had their first child, who was baptized according to the quote-unquote orthodox rite. So, multiple promises being violated, uh, without which, if, had the promises not been made, the dispensation for a mixed marriage would never have been uh, given. 
Dr. Cannon 2319 stipulated another excommunication. The Pope denounced once again those who had violated the sanctity of Catholic marriage, and Roncalli offered to the Queen a handsome missal as a sign that she was not included in the Pope's displeasure. So, if, as this is Father Rocoso's question here, if perhaps the Queen submitted against her will, what could be said of the King? Obviously, for her to go along with this was, uh, it's in itself, inexcusable. Uh, if she went along, she, at, at the most, you might say, her culpability might be reduced. But even so, it's very bad. But you cannot, uh, there's no way that you could possibly justify the king in this. But what does Roncalli do? In his heart, he could not bring himself to utterly condemn King Boris. Since the very first meeting, April 1925, there was not a single word about the difficulty between Tsar Ferdinand and Leo XIII, not the slightest allusion to the religious situation of the king. So the, the apostolic, well, apostolic visitor, now apostolic delegate, says nothing about it. Roncalli. Roncalli's stay in the Bulgarian purgatory was prolonged a little too long, or had been by this point, even for someone supposedly very humble like him, who was supposedly far from all careerism. So he, he definitely doesn't like being there, but while he's there, he certainly manages to make a mess of things. So uh, he said, uh, I remember he'd said just a short time after his arrival, 1926, uh, he complained, I have been a bishop for 20 months. As foreseen, my ministry has had to suffer tribulation. Yet, curious thing, these tribulations did not come to me from the Bulgarians for whom I worked, but from the central organs of the ecclesiastical administration. In other words, from the Pope. From, in this case, Pius XI. Three years later, in 1929, Roncalli suffered a crisis but she left several impressions, that of having been forgotten and abandoned, a sense of frustration about his plans for the Bulgarian church, unrealizable in fact, and finally, the disagreeable impression of having arrived at the dead end of his career. So he def definitely doesn't like it there, but it wasn't exactly intended as a, as a way <coughs> to set him up anyway. In 1929, he hoped for a promotion to the See of Milan, a hope which was quickly dashed. After the anti-ecumenical encyclical Mortalium Animos, 1928, and the difficulties from 1930 to 1933 due to the, marriages of the, king, the marriage of the king, Roncalli was not altogether at ease, and everyone preferred that he leave Bulgaria. So, he's really made a mess of things there. Uh, so, Pius XI is going to get him out, and the new nomination, this promotion, so unexpected, was dated November 24th, 1934. Called it to Turkey and Greece, he left on January 4th, 1935. So this is getting him, you see, ever farther from, from the center of things, ever farther from Rome itself, in fact. He's getting, getting pushed more and more off to the side. And perhaps each time technically getting promoted, but in fact, it's just getting him away from the center of things. So uh, he would do other things though, as apostolic delegate to Turkey, uh, which we'll see here. Uh, he found himself in the delicate situation of representing the Vatican to a nation which did not recognize any religion. So this was, uh, well, we have a brief description of it here, but Turkey by this point, remember, had for a long time been the Ottoman Empire, which was dissolved at the end of the First World War, and now they're intent on becoming a secularized, westernized state, which is what they are today. So we'll, we'll see some of the details of that here, just to get an idea of the context we're looking at. Ancient Byzantium, which had taken the name of Constantinople in becoming the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, the Oriental Empire, meaning the Eastern Roman Empire, separated from the unity of the church for the first time in 857, that was the Phocian Schism, and, and for the second time, definitive and actual fact, in 1054. And that is, of course, despite a couple of attempts at reunions, which were actually effected, but then that was, they broke away again. So she was conquered at Byzantium, remember this is the eastern the city, now called Istanbul, was once called Byzantium. And then, yes, the Emperor Constantine decided to move the capital further east, far, far, much further to the east. And the reason for that was, uh, the, at, at the time, the east was, the Middle East, was really the center of civilization. All the big cities were there. That's where everything, that's really, if you look at it, that's actually the, the, the general area in which civilization first appeared. 
Uh, and so that was really the center of things. So really Rome, this uh, really a, built in a swamp, a backwater place, and no, nobody's quite sure actually to this day, nobody's quite sure why Rome was located where it's located, who thought this was a good spot to build a city. Nobody's quite sure who was the first one to decide that. Uh, I mean, there's nothing really to recommend that spot. Uh, uh, the, the fact that Rome, of all places, came to rule the world was something really, really uh, it's, it's really uh, quite surprising when you can take everything into consideration. So by that point, and by the uh, uh, fourth century, uh, Emperor Constantine, well, if one thing, the empire had become huge at that point, and the emperor wanted to have the capital closer to the center of civilization. So he decided to build up the city of Byzantium, rename it after himself, uh, borough court in all modesty, and set that up as the capital of the empire. Hence the name Constantinople. Uh, Constantinople was conquered in 1453 by the Turks, who made her the capital of the Ottoman Empire, which in turn collapsed following the defeat suffered in World War I, giving way to a Turkish Republic, nationalistic, populist, lay, and revolutionary, led by Mustafa Kemal, called Ataturk, father of all the Turks, or father of the Turks. So 1453, keep in mind that, yes, the, the Western Roman Empire finally collapsed in the late 5th century, but the Eastern Empire lasted in, in some form, to some extent, until the mid-15th century. So it, it is known uh, variously as you know, the Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire, uh, the, it, it's citizens known as the, the Eastern Romans or the Byzantines, uh, but they really are sometimes known as the Greek Empire because they spoke Greek. But that lasted to some extent. There were attempts to uh, rebuild it. You have, for example, the Emperor Justinian who sought to, from Constantinople, to rebuild the whole Western Empire, to, to put, to reassemble the entire Roman Empire and uh, rule it from Constantinople, and he was successful to a degree. Uh, very famously, with the, uh, with the assistance of the famous General Belisarius, who's sometimes known as the Last Roman. Uh, but uh, aside from such attempts, it was really the only the, the Eastern Empire that survived, and even that gradually eroded until the mid-15th century. The only thing left of it was really the city of Constantinople itself, uh, perhaps some, some small amount of territory outside of it. But uh, the, when the, the Turks besieged Constantinople in 1453 and finally took it, that was, that was pretty much all that was left of it. And then they finally took that and made it the capital of their own empire. So, and in after, after the collapse of the Turkish Empire uh, in the end of the First World War, they, they retained the city of Constantinople, but they, they decided to, go, to relabel it by its Turkish name, Istanbul, and move the capital to Ankara, where it is today. So consequently, this is a secular state we're looking at now. You know, prior to that, the Ottoman Empire was, in principle anyway, a militant is Islamist state looking to go on jihad, as in fact they did many times. And I believe they, they invaded, they besieged Vienna more than once. Uh, they were very aggressive. They very aggressively invaded Europe uh, multiple times. And their empire, remember, Aust the Austrian Empire and the Turkish Empire at one time bordered each other. Now, those are two of the, Austria and Turkey are, you know, their borders are separated by, uh, by, a, by, a, by a long distance, but at one point their empires bordered each other, and they fought wars against each other. <coughs> That's it. Uh, That's to say that the, the Christian nations of Europe had to fight defensive wars against uh, aggressive uh, Muslim attempts to, to conquer everything. But by this point, yeah, that's long past, uh, Turkey has no more, or very, very little, to this day, there is one part of Istanbul that is considered to be the, the European section of it. Uh, but uh, so it's considered to be the only city that is located on two continents, so it is said, uh, that has parts on two continents. Uh, that it has a, it's, it's known for that. Uh, there might be some who debate that and claim, but in any case, uh, that's what it's known for, uh, among other things. Uh, but by this point, this is definitely a westernized, secularized state. At least, that, at least that's what they're moving towards, and we'll see how that affects Roncalli while he is there and what he does in response to it. Uh, consequently, it was a secular state whose Muslim population did not acknowledge a Christian, actually schismatic for the most part, minority, and where there were only about 35,000 Catholics, so even fewer. 62,000 Catholics in Bulgaria, remember, that was considered a low number. 
Now if he's getting, Roncalli is getting pushed farther from Rome physically, but also into an area with even fewer Catholics. So the first chance to make the enemies of the church happy with his trusty smile immediately presented itself. The secularization proclaimed by Ataturk included dress. After having westernized the Turks, he now had to lay aside the religious. This was a question not only of doing away with uh, everything that might uh, bring to mind militant Islamism, but also, in fact, any kind of practice of religion at all, period. He was trying to bring about a completely secularized state. Just wanted to bring about a modern republic in every way, according to all, along all the lines of, of, West, of the Western liberal democracies, and pushed that, we'll say, aggressively. So Ataturk himself, though, actually, we can just keep in mind who, his background, he was himself a war hero. He was um, uh, famous uh, for his ability to rally Turkish troops. So, so we talk about the, uh, the history of the Turks being extremely aggressive. Uh, at a certain point, they subsided. Every, this happens to every nation. has its day in the sun, and after that recedes. Yeah, I remember by the time of the early 20th century, the Turkish Empire was the sick man of Europe. Far from being the, uh, the, the aggressive, uh, militant empire seeking to expand and, and <coughs> living in everybody's nightmares was quite the opposite. It was the receding power, uh, bits and pieces of whose empire every, all the other empires were snatching at. New nations being... or nations that have been uh, politically gone for many centuries by that point, coming back to life. Uh, that's Serbia, for example, came, came back to life as a nation in the, in the wake of the recession of the Turkish Empire. And uh, that's ultimately, it was a highlight, that's one of the reasons that made the Balkans such a, a volatile area that ended up leading to the outbreak of the First World War is all of the, the chaos, I mean, it's still a, it's still a turbulent region, but uh, it was particularly chaotic at the time in the, in the uh, wake of the disintegrating Turkish Empire. Who was going to? It, it was left something of a power vacuum. The Turks had ruled that area for so long, uh, all of a sudden they're gone, and now who's going to come, come into power after that? So you know, uh, Bulgaria emerged as a nation. We've been talking about Bulgaria. That emerged as a nation in the wake of that. Uh, other nations as well, say Romania, uh, Serbia, but then also, say, uh, the, the Austrians wanted to expand into that vacuum. So it led to that. Ultimately, that provided the spark for the First World War, in which Mustafa Kemal uh, emerged as a, as a war hero who uh, rallied, was able to rally the, the, the Turkish troops, who uh, by this point, the, the Turkish military was a shadow of what it had been in previous centuries and uh, needed people like uh, war heroes such as uh, Mustafa Kemal to, to get them to fight well. They needed, uh, the, the German officers were amongst the, uh, the Turkish armies trying to hold things together. Kemal, his, his presence on the battlefield was so imperative that uh, he had a doctor following him around administering stimulants to him all the time to keep him <laughs> just constantly moving uh, for much longer periods of time than you can ordinarily keep moving. Uh, because if he wasn't there, the Turks would just stop fighting, or, or at least they would, their morale would drop significantly, which is a huge thing on the battlefield. So that's how you can see this is, this is the man who ended up, after the war, becoming the, the president of the new republic. That's how much of a war hero he was. And this is, <clears throat> so when he's, his, the agenda that he's pushing is going to go through. People will, will follow him into anything, pretty much. So religious habits were abolished by a law which came into force on June 13th, 1935. <clears throat> Beyond the drastic reduction of religious habits, the profaning intention was obvious. Several institutes of sisters expressed their grief, closed it down afterwards in the face of scandal, and left Turkey. Aged, priest, aged priests preached ardently against the proud impiety of the secular and persecuting state. Even the quote-unquote orthodox patriarch threatened to retire in scornful exile enclosed in his palace. And then this is Father Ricosa here. Uh, and our bishop says, uh, referring to Roncalli, he did not take this measure too tragically and commented, what does it matter whether we wear the cassock or trousers as long as we proclaim the word of God? What does it matter if we're not allowed to uh, wear um, clerical attire anymore or religious aren't allowed to wear their, their habits anymore? What, what difference does that make? 
So behold the swallowed insult. But behold as well the excessive joy that Roncalli felt in gulping down affronts. The same day that the law came into force, he ordered his priests to meet at the church. After the divine office, one could witness the strangest procession in the life of John the Twenty-Third. The apostolic delegate, remember that is Roncalli, followed by very embarrassed elderly priests and all the clergy, left the church in secular dress. Now, you couldn't make that up. Just imagine what, what that ceremony must have been like. How did, what, what went on? How did they change uh, into secular attire in the, while, while uh, after, during the, during, the, during the singing of the divine office? But that must have been very strange. Uh, Monsignor kept for himself the Roman collar as head of and representing the Catholic Church in Turkey. Religious leaders were actually exempted from the general law, but Bishop Roncalli kept only this one distinctive sign in order to encourage his priests to sacrifice and to oblige the religious to put on the habit of charity of Christ instead of their monastic habit. That was his idea. So not, not only did this is uh, something that um, in any other situation the church would say, no, absolutely not, we're not going to lay aside all religious garb because of the uh, uh, because of the persecution of a, of a, of a, of a secularized state. Now, this is a type of persecution, of course, it may not be bloody persecution. It's one thing, yes, for example, priests in Mexico in the 1920s went around wearing suits, uh, just dressed as, as businessmen, but because they would have been killed otherwise. This is just caving in, even joyously caving in, embracing the, the, these, these laws of a, of a secularizing state, and that's it. So two rows of people, Christian, either properly or loosely so-called, and Muslim, witnessed this extraordinary procession, disarmed by the smile of the apostolic delegate, who advanced casually as if he had always worn a jacket and trousers. Among the first filing past was Bishop Roncalli's secretary, Don Angelo uh, Delacqua, the future cardinal. Don Angelo had already received the news of his transfer to Rome and thus could have abstained from this demonstration, leaving the country before the historic festival and before the decree went into effect. But the delegate did not wish it thus. His eminence thought it would have offended the Turkish government. He wished that I remain and that I have a secular suit made like the other priests. This, uh, this is Don Angelo de Lacqua telling us this. One morning he had, sent, he had me send for a tailor who took my measurements and chose the material himself, the best. I had never owned such an expensive suit, so beautiful and sturdy. I made a present of it to my father, who kept it many years, and it always looked new. And so it was that, without any necessity, because the law itself exempted him, Bishop Roncalli has immortalized himself by the photograph showing him dressed in a bowler hat and sober suit, looking for all the world like a Lombard businessman who made it difficult to cut down on the pasta. Indeed, uh, definitely. In fact, at one point, uh, John the Twenty Third, yeah, after his own election, even said, uh, so "There's such a difference between St. Pius X and myself." He said, uh, um, "He said, as, as big as I am, I don't even resemble him physically." <laughs> that's that's a quotation from him. So uh, I guess at this point he was already putting on the pounds, apparently, for which he was famous. Uh, so, yeah, at, this is, we're talking about a situation here in which, of course, this is not authorized by the church. This is not to be put on the same level, of course, as the wearing of the clerical suit required by laws of the church uh, by the clergy in public in various different places. Uh, the, this, is a, this is something else entirely. This is uh, yeah, putting aside all, all religious garb, anything that might even suggest it, uh, just because of the, you know, the pressure of a secularizing state which Roncalli embraces. So this next section, um, again, I'm, I don't know Turkish, but the best I can tell, it should be pronounced Tanre Mab uh, Mubarek Olsun, is the, uh, the, those are some of the words of the divine praises in Turkish, actually, and we'll see what happens with this. Roncalli's biographer continues the narrative. He, Roncalli, decided at the start of 1936 to introduce a few words of Turkish into worship. From January 12th, 1936, the divine praises, blessed be God, or really should be, really ought to be blessed to be God in English, but the, 
the older way of saying it, blessed be God remains, blessed be his holy name, etc., were to be recited in Turkish. It was a small change, indicative of his desire that the church should make its home among the Turkish people. So actually, in itself, to have the divine praises done in the vernacular is not something unheard of. That could, that's, that's permissible in itself. But we'll see how to do it in Turkish, specifically, actually doesn't make any sense. Uh, and the, the intention with which Roncalli did that was clearly problematic. So uh, we'll see that. Uh, not, not, it's not that this is something intrinsically evil, but clearly the motives that prompted it were not good. So, but as his pontificate showed, as a John the Twenty Third supposed pontificate, any change of principle can have an importance far beyond its immediate effect. For example, when he added the name of Saint Joseph to the canon of the Mass, he showed that the text was neither immutable nor inviolable. In 1936, the changes were not appreciated by everyone. In his diary, he records, when the Tanre Mubarek Osun, Blessed Be God, was recited, many people left the church displeased. But I am happy. That's Rokali. On Sunday, the gospel in Turkish before the French ambassador. The, today, the litany in Turkish before the Italian ambassador. The Catholic Church respects everyone. So he's already uh, looking towards the Novus Ordo. The apostolic delegate is a bishop for all and intends to honor the gospel, which does not admit national monopolies, is not fossilized, and looks to the future. So that, this is another author talking about Roncalli. This is not the official biographer at this point, but this is uh, somebody who also likes him. Roncalli saw his linguistic innovations as a way of making the church more genuinely Catholic, which is, makes no sense on many levels. Uh, for one thing, the, the very fact that the church has Latin as its own language uh, and that, that employs it everywhere, that you know, indicates the unity of faith of the church, obviously. Yes, the church can grant concessions in certain cases, but not for really uh, motives that are clearly ecumenical in this case. Uh, in October, uh, so he was announced to Rome for this. In his October 1936 retreat, he remarks that the difference between my way of seeing situations on the spot and certain ways of judging the same things in Rome hurts me considerably. It is my only real cross. So ne never mind having to lay aside religious garb. This is his real, his real cross. So Father Acosta comments, in reality, I have trouble seeing how the gospel, the pater, and the divine praises in Turkish could attract Catholics who, not being Muslims, were not of Turkish heritage or language. Indeed, the complaints were not long in coming. With this innovation, then, he, Roncalli, was not seeking the approval of the faithful, but that of the government. So it's really, it's a pathetic attempt to try to make the church more appealing to the Turkish government by carrying out some of our ceremonies in Turkish. Yeah. Ceremonies which certainly secularized Muslims are not attending. This just makes no sense on any level. And the motives are, are bad, too. Father Tanzella writes reasonably that, this is one of the authors, other authors that Father Ricosa quotes, he writes reasonably that the acceptance of secular dress and the introduction of the national language into the Catholic churches attracted to the apostolic delegate the sympathy of the government. Even if his title was not officially recognized, his person was known and the man was esteemed as much by the government as by the president, Ataturk himself. So does not attract Catholics, certainly, and the government, they're not going to be attending these ceremonies, but it's something to make them happier. The liturgy in Turkish actually opened the doors of the government to Roncalli, and the next year, he was received by the Under Secretary of Foreign Affairs, whose name I want to try to pronounce, who told him, we guarantee you the most ample liberty of ministry in everything which does not contradict or oppose our laws. We do not like to use titles which imply in some way that this is recognition of some religious activity, even though the respect for such an activity be absolute. The secularization of the state is our fundamental principle, the guarantee of our liberty. <laughs> you see how just how ardently they are pursuing this liberalization. 
They're trying to be on the, on the losing side of a big war. Many times nations do this. They'll, they'll, they'll very eagerly thereafter seek to demonstrate that they've put their past behind them. In this case, Turkey's looking at this. Yes, the Turkish Empire yeah, it was definitely responsible for atrocities during the war, the famous Armenian Genocide, for example. They, they, went at, they suffered, a, the Turks suffered a catastrophic defeat at one point, mainly due to their own lack of preparation for winter weather. Uh, but they, they blamed it on the Armenians, and they went after them after that. Uh, so that they're, at this point, clearly they're trying to put behind themselves the, well, it was a generally you know, uh, anti-imperial feeling at this, at this point, after the, uh, immediately after the war. Uh, the, of course, the empires that were on the losing side were dissolved, and, and the, their dissolution and the subsequent formation of many nations out of those empires was seen as something great. This is setting, lo letting loose the prisons of nations that these empires were. And now this is uh, where things are much better now as a result. In reality, uh, just the wars continued constantly. There were many wars in between the two world wars, let's not forget, uh, starting with the Russian Civil War itself. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the Turks are very ardently pursuing this. Uh, a similar phenomenon is actually was Japan after the Second World War. They, uh, they, very, uh, they sought very much to put behind themselves their imperial samurai past. There are still certain things that remain from that, uh, even to this day, but they very much, I mean, Japan did, very much as the Turks are doing at this point, uh, they very much westernized and secularized themselves, uh, to a great extent. And still uh, visiting Japan to this day, you'd still think, uh, not that I've been there, but by all accounts, you'd still feel like you're visiting a different planet. They're still, their culture is still very different, even if they've taken on many Westernized, uh, westernized uh, Western elements and secularized themselves to a great degree. But actually, even before the war, Japan was westernizing itself to a degree. Uh, they, they saw themselves as the Great Britain of the of the Far East. Uh, so they they based their they want I mean they built up to themselves up to be a naval power for one thing, and they designed their naval uniforms based on British naval uniforms and things like that. So even before the war, they were already taking cues from the West. But after the war, they embraced it very very eagerly. They wanted to show they'd put their past behind themselves. And part of someone who was in, uh, set up to govern Japan uh, post-war uh, was General MacArthur, who of course spearheaded the war against the Japanese, and who was a Freemason. And when you read his own memoirs as to what his program was in going into Japan, it's all of the typical westernized liberal stuff that's in, it's all um, uh, Freemasonry inspired. So he was... Uh, that, that's what he set out to do, and that's what he did um, to this day. Uh, Japan is, to a great extent, westernized and secularized. Basically, nations tend to do that once they've been on the losing side of a big war. They tend to do that. Germany has done the same thing. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Germany had a long history of being very militaristic and so forth. Remember that Napoleon said of Prussia that it was hatched out of a cannonball. <laughs> <Once>. <laughs> A statement that, yes, is always amusing. But uh, there's something to that. Yes, they were very militaristic. See, all of the goose-stepping and all the marching, all of that is Prussian. It's the, all that stuff that you associate when you think of the Third Reich. You think of, yes, German soldiers with the rather, if you ask me, rather ridiculous-looking goose-stepping, all that stuff, all of the, the military uniforms and all of that. That's all Prussia. That's Prussian culture. And that, that was all very, but you know, historically very much, uh, or among the first images that you think of when you think of German culture. There are other aspects, too. You think of, say, actually, the way that much of the world celebrates Christmas is actually the Bavarian way of celebrating Christmas. <laughs> they exported that very successfully throughout the world. Uh, that was another thing, actually, that the Nazis seized upon, was the German liking for celebrating Christmas. They, their Christmas figures in their propaganda. But uh, without any kind of reference to our Lord, now, then, without any reference to any kind of religious significance, but it's just a... They seized upon it as a cultural thing. So, but now Germany, with that militaristic past, now they're pacifistic. <laughs> and their military is neglected. Uh, they, they want to make it clear that they put their past behind themselves, things like that. So nations tend to do this when they've, uh, they want to show that they've, they've well, yes, we were bad before, and we lost a war, and now we're, but now we're, now we're you know, fixing ourselves up. And they go to the opposite extreme in many cases. You see, that, that's what we're looking at here with Turkey. So just to give you an idea of the, the situation we're looking at. 
So the church will refrain, Roncalli says, the church will refrain from diminishing or disputing such a secularization. Now, of course, it's not a bad thing that uh, Turkey should get rid of uh, professing uh, is Islam, obviously, as a state religion, but secularization is not a good thing either. The, the, he should be looking to convert the nation. He should not be saying, oh, the church will just be happy if you secularize yourselves. Which is clear that he might not be saying that, but that's definitely the impression that he's giving. That's when you see the church will refrain from diminishing or disputing such a secularization. That, that clearly says we're happy with this. He says, I am optimistic. In everything, I seek rather to develop what unites rather than what divides. Well, that sounds very ecumenical. Being in agreement on natural principles, we can go to the end of the road together. So even he admits this is very naturalistic. Of course, it doesn't, it's not really an admission in the sense of acknowledging it as something bad. He thinks it's something good. But that is indeed what he thinks. For my part, I have already introduced the Turkish language into the church. So the Ankara conversation is important. Again, this is taking place in the city of Ankara, which to this day is the capital of Turkey. Uh, because one can already discern therein the new sign of the times, which John the Twenty-Third would proclaim, and which the Second Vatican Council, the Ecumenical Council, would proclaim in its constitution on the church in the modern world. So, clearly Roncalli went into you know, John the Twenty-Third, called Vatican II with all of these, you know, the, the intention in mind of of uh, adapting the church to the modern world. And remember, that's, it's, it's because of his intention that uh, we say that he was not a true pope. That, uh, uh, in other words, if, uh, look at it this way, uh, he was the one who's, who got the, Vatican, the ship of Vatican II on its way. He was the one who took the ship out of the harbor. If Paul VI was the one who later on unfurled all the sails, uh, John the Twenty-Third was the one who embarked on the journey. He was the captain of the ship at that point. And uh, he set it on its course, and after he died, it just continued along the course that he had set for it. And so clearly he intended the end result. And Paul VI clearly makes reference to that. Or actually, I'm thinking, actually, sorry, JP II clearly makes reference to that when, in the promulgation of the 1983 Code of Canon Law. So there's no question of it what John XXIII intended to do. So this, all of this that we're establishing here, uh, his uh, indication of what was in his mind when he called Vatican II. So the secularization of the state is one of our fundamental principles. Anyway, this is what the, the uh, Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs, the Turkish Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs, said to Roncalli. And to these words, Roncalli answered that the church will refrain from diminishing or disputing such a secularization, which is incredible. And Father Rikosa comments, these are very grave words, which diplomacy itself cannot justify in the mouth of the one who represented Pope Pius XI, who had taught that, uh, Pius XI, who had taught that the pestilence that infects society, the plague of our times is secularization, its errors and its impious crimes. That was from the encyclical Quas primas and the social kingship of Jesus Christ from December 11th, 1925. And which also, actually, he, Pius XI, promulgated the Feast of Christ the King. So that's a relatively recent feast, which makes the fact that it has a very nice music uh, to the, the, the musical setting of the Mass and the Office is very nice, makes that somewhat surprising. Usually the more recent the feast, the more horrible the music, the more horrible the chant that goes with it for some reason. Uh, but in this case, it's very nice. But actually, it's because when you look at it, a little more closely, you realize it's because it, those are older melodies that were <laughs> repurposed. Uh, and one sign of that is the fact that if you look at the hymn, there are many, many elisions, many syllables you have to skip. Uh, that means that it's a new text shoehorned into an old melody, <laughs> which means that uh, it doesn't quite fit, <laughs> but it's being repurposed for that. But the point is that the, the melodies themselves are old and therefore nice, probably from some feast that was either not universal or was retired or something. At some point, uh, or, uh, who knows where it could have come from. You have to investigate that, but uh, that's why it's nice. And also that encyclical, uh, easily, Christ the King, Feast of Christ the King is e easily the longest day of the year for reciting matins and lauds uh, during the divine office. It takes, usually, it, on average, it takes about 45 minutes, 40, 45 minutes to recite matins and lauds. Not singing. Singing takes hours. 
but reciting takes 40, 45 minutes. Uh, on Feast of Christ the King, it takes one full hour uh, because the, the le it's because of the lessons, the length of the lessons. And it, it includes, if not, those lessons include, if not the whole encyclical Quas Primas, then a big chunk of it. And that's the reason why the lessons just go, especially the second doctrine lessons just go on and on. Which is not a bad thing, it's just you have to allow more time to recite Matins and Laws on that day. Just something to keep in mind when you get to the point of reciting the office. So on average, it's 40, 45 minutes to recite Matins and Laws, 50 minutes on a, on a day when the lessons might be unusually long ordinarily, but Christ the King takes a full hour to allow that. So in the face of such affirmations, as made by Roncalli, one can legitimately ask himself if, in 1937, Bishop Roncalli was still Catholic. Now, sir, legally, certainly, there's no question of that. But the question is, did he even have the virtue of faith at this point? It's questionable. You could legitimately, as Father Rocosa is pointing out here, one can legitimately ask that question. In 1937, over 20 years before he was elected, the question can be legitimately raised, did he, does he even have the virtue of faith? Next section, some varnish on dogma, certainly not to make it more splendid, but to blot it out. The inscription filioque was expunged from the front of the building of the apostolic delegation. May the reader, this is Father Ricosa, may the reader not be surprised if we impute such an exploit to Bishop Roncalli. He who co-signed, as we co-signed, or no, this is consigned the encyclicals of the Pope, mortalium animos against ecumenism, Quas primas against laicism to oblivion. If so, may the reader not be surprised if Roncalli, who could do that, was not troubled by scruples. Yeah, scruples in a good sense here. Most of the time you hear of scruples, that's a bad thing. Scruples in the spiritual life, but it can't be used in a good sense. That is to say, uh, the voice of conscience saying that this is something that is bad. Um, he could do this uh, without, any, any, without being troubled in conscience at all. Uh, that... Uh, yeah. It's not, not surprising that Roncalli could get rid of the word filioque from the front of the building of the apostolic delegation if he could just disregard papal encyclicals on points of capital importance. So this is the, Father Rocosa calls it the prophetic deed, quote-unquote, prophetic deed, but of a false prophet, which was done under orders from the apostolic delegate himself. Now there's a sign of, of, of the Vatican II ecumenism to come. Everyone knows that Catholics, contrary to the quote-unquote orthodox, believe that in the Holy Trinity, the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son, and not, from, not only from the Father. So, qui ex patri filioque procedit. So, how many times have we sung it? Or how, he says, how many times have we not sung it? In other words, many times indeed. This is the question he expects, or it's a positive answer, many times. We have sung it many times in the Credo at Mass, or in the Tantu Mergo, procedenti avutroque proceeding from each one. So at Lyon, on the occasion, we, we made reference to this the other day, at Lyon, on the occasion of the, or probably Lyons, Lyon, perhaps, I can't check that, on the occasion of the Council of Union with the Eastern Rite Churches, the fathers were even made to chant the filioque three times in the credo. Make it clear that, yes, we, indeed, we believe that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. Do you study all of that when you take the chorus de Deo Trino, which is, one of the most difficult, but one of the most interesting dogmatic theology courses concerning the triune God, concerning the Blessed Trinity. As Father P. Spinelli writes uh, to the contrary in the, uh, concerning this situation, the pastoral and ecumenical vocation of Roncalli manifested itself more and more in particularly significant gestures, such as erasing the filioque, which had been written in capital letters on the front of the Apostolic Delegation Building as a sign of open polemics with the Orthodox. Yeah, here, here comes the term polemics yeah, being used uh, to, to denigrate in some way a uh, profession of faith. Now that's, that's a powerful way of, of, of professing faith in an area uh, populated largely by, by schismatics, who are also heretics in this way, uh, to have the, the word filioque written on the front of the building. If you cannot look at the building without seeing it, that's the idea. <laughs> you see it, you know, you're reminded every time of this truth of the faith, which the Catholic Church professes, 
and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of reprimanding those heretics for not professing it, a way of exhorting them to return to the faith. So these ecumenical erasures would proceed with the council. Vatican II. To be continued.